Sir. How are Hello, you? Hello, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> no. Right, let's go straight into this then. So, thanks for coming today and having a chat on the What Really Matters podcast. I'm just going to go through and ask a few questions and we're going to find out a little bit about yourself and find out a little bit about your experiences working with young people. Um, and I can't wait because, as you know, I'm a massive fan. What was it like for you growing up in your community? What were the challenges and what were the positives that you faced? What were the challenges? There was lots of challenges, actually, but I guess they were they were challenges, but even though I really, really rebelled hard and was a pain in the neck as a teenager, I had a really strong family unit. I was really, really lucky in my childhood, actually, that although I exasperated and pushed people to the limits, and we were I'm one of four in a big family and a family that is all very self-opinionated. So one thing about my family is that everybody's got an opinion and they all think theirs is right. So we were brought up that you could have any opinion you wanted because that's your right, but you weren't allowed to just stand in the corner and shout your mouth off, my father's words. You had to be able to back it up with reasoned argument. So from the age of about seven, we were taught how to argue your corner, how to listen to other people. And I kind of grew up thinking that that's what other people had. So I've, I've never been frightened to say what I think. Because I was brought up that that's your right to do so. But you're not allowed just to stand and shout in the corner. You've got to be able to, you know. And the other, his other little words were, you can't fight City Hall unless you get into City Hall. You can fight it from within, but you can't from outside. You have to get in first. Then you can change the world, but you have to understand how it works. So I then realised when you get to school, that's not true. Especially secondary school. Because funny enough, they're not interested in your opinion. So I did not have a good experience at school. I came out of school believing I was thick, but I had nothing much to contribute to the world and that there was something wrong with me as a person because teachers didn't like me. It's left me with a lifelong distrust of authority. <laughs> and I have to question everything as to why, you know, which isn't a bad thing, I guess, when your main source, you know, of income now is research for training and writing. I want to know how something works. I have to take it all apart before I can do anything and train other people. So although I wasn't very popular with my teachers, I was popular with my peers. And I had lots of them that would, you know, I was always up for a jaunt, particularly out of school grounds. And it's quite interesting. My last parent died recently. And I probably wouldn't have said this because she always likes to listen. She always looked at my books and always wanted to hear the podcast. Oh, here we go. This I know. Bring it on. <laughs> so I was, I was permanently excluded from school. Never finished mainstream school. I went from there. The local art college took me on the strength of my art portfolio. And so I thought, great, well, that now gives me license not to even bother in the exams because I was allowed to go back in and sit the exams. And I was like, well, I, I want to be an artist anyway. And the art college has accepted me because they think I'm good. So I now won't make any effort whatsoever. So rather than being something that sort of spurred me on for a last minute bit of glory, the only topics I did well in, because unfortunately what I was good at was reading things and then being able to answer questions on them. So that's literally what I did for my exams. I read the books and answered the questions. So I came out with five GCSEs and that was it. I never went back. I didn't pick up any of those certificates. I never went back. And I went to art college and loved it and realised that actually, again, once again, this was about me expressing myself and being with like-minded people and I thought, if I can find my tribe, every young person must be able to. And I think it's what I carry into youth work with me is the need that kids get written off too easily. And I don't think schools, certainly not the educational system we have, is the right place for all young people. Some do well, and that's brilliant. You know, I've heard them described by Des Holmes, whose work I love, and she describes them to me as the shiny kids. You know, they're going to do well wherever. But sometimes schools, some youth says, we exploit them a little bit because we 
puff them up and we send them out to talk about things and represent all young people. And whilst they do represent some, they can't represent all. So for me, it's about how do we get those voices that I never heard heard? How do we include those young people who feel completely disconnected from everything that's going on and give them the same opportunities so that when we say we're an inclusive service, we really are. We're not just saying it. Wow. Well, I tell you what, hearing that, there are so many similarities that it's unbelievable, which kind of makes sense based on previous conversations we've had. But there we, there we go. Um, like, like calls to like. And I think, I mean, I'm a pretty much a kinesthetic learner. I love anything that I can get my hands on and actually do, get in the middle of and do, which is how, what all my work is, really. That all my activities tend to be, there's lots of art-based or conversation-based or drama-based. There's nothing I don't think about numbers in there because I'm discalculate. I've told you that before. In fact, yes, last week I spent all of one afternoon the publisher for my new book had sent the book back and the manuscript because for every activity I have to put an estimated time. And that was I'd done that all right. But what I'd done is I'd added them all up wrong on every single one. So I had to go through the whole book, recalculate, and this time do it with my, you know, the, the calculator on my phone, add up what each of them has up to to give an overall time. So they were all wrong. And that is not unusual. And as a kid, I would have done anything to hide that because I equated that to shame. So I would do anything to hide the fact I can't do numbers. Now I just laugh about it. And I've found ways to do numbers. I write them down as words. Well, I just it's, it's interesting what, what, you're, what you're talking about. I suppose I'm just uh, painting a bit of a picture of what it was like for you when, you when you were growing up. And then we start talking a bit more about, you know, what you've been doing professionally with young people and, and some of the, the differences now compared to 20 years ago, for example. But you know, what kind of things were you doing then when you, when you were going through school and after school as a young adult? What kind of things were you doing with friends and out in the community? Or, I mean, I would say keep it clean, but I don't care. Just tell the truth. So on a Saturday, my favourite Saturdays was going up the King's Road in all my, all my punk regalia to shout at the police at the, top of the King's Road. <laughs> Oh, and, and, and get Japanese to tourists idea. to pay us five quid, ten quid, or twenty quid a time to take our photos, and we thought that was great. So there were probably loads of photos of me. It wasn't just Japanese tourists, but they paid the best. Standing outside a London phone box in my leather jacket with all the studs and my and my Hecan boyfriend, with. <laughs> Are you saying? Um, I was doing that from about the age of fourteen onwards. <laughs> and when did, it, when did that stop? I mean, and how and why did that stop? Oh, the stop to my gallop was getting pregnant when I was still a teenager <laughs> and oh, having a child you? young. Um, I was quite young, but I wasn't that young. I was about 19. So having a baby, I suddenly thought, mm, hang on. Well, I took her to Glastonbury, you know, and all of that. So I, I kept it alive for a while. It was just, it didn't really work once she became a toddler and needed... And I just had in other interests because I sort of looked at her and thought, as always, I'm very loyal to my mates. She's my new gang. What are we going to do then, babe? Because I can't just drift about forevermore. We've got to do something. And I'd worked kind of in design studios and things like that. And I wanted to be better at art than I was, is the truth. You know, I was good, small, you know, big fish in small pond. I wasn't going to change the world. And I was always a better writer anyway, but I didn't discover that really. My parents were always really proud of my writing. I had, well, it's a scoop, I had a poem published in a book when I was about nine. And I was the most doomy, gloomy child, all about death and darkness. Yeah, so very dark and some very fanciful thought goes you know, way before you had all your studs on and everything. Maybe yeah. it was a sign. I know, all that black. So music <laughs> is my other passion in life and continues to be. So I guess you'll see me in the same places now through the summer at some music festival or other. Off to Nottingham at the weekend to the Woodland Disco with my entire family, all my kids, my Ooh. husband, all of us. Yeah, ex husband, we're all going. Yeah. Oh, so, which will be fun. Yeah, it's going to be brilliant. 
Oh, you like Russell Brunson? Like... <laughs> what, 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 what did you just say? You I'm like Woods? Party. I love, I love a party and I love going to the woods. Yes, absolutely. So Let's there you move go. On. So I loved all of that. I liked Glastonbury. I liked. I used to go down to Elephant Fair in Devon as well, quite quite often. That was always good. So anywhere there was a live music that I could get my head right up on the sound system. So I was, you know, on the Punk's Not Dead tour or whatever else. I was always lurking around with some band member somewhere, is pretty much. All right. Pretending so... I was older than I was. <laughs> I just, I mean, it's interesting hearing you say, because I knew you said you went to, to art college. I didn't yeah. know that you went from art college working in a design job, you know, working within that too. You had, a, had your daughter when you were 19. So at what point did you change from doing the design kind of work into work? How did, yeah, how yeah. did that happen? No, so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't keep up with the life. The life in a London design studio was good. Champagne arrived on your desk at three o'clock on a Friday. Out crying entertainment all night. Rush job in, you've got to work through the night on it. Can't do that with a baby, especially not when you're on your own. So I just did some private work for a while, design work. And again, if I'd had three sleepless nights on the trot, there's no way I was coming up with anything that good. And so I did chart minding for a bit. And while I was doing that, I decided that I needed to improve my mind. So I spent each summer holiday, sort of uh, one year I looked at world religions and, and another I was looking at psychology. Because I'd always been interested in what made people do the mad things that they did. And more than that, because, you know, I did mad things, but I never did anything too mad. How comes I stayed safe and I had some friends who did not stay safe and some who were, you know, dead by the time they were 21? So what was it? We were all having this, doing the same things, more or less. And, and that interest has driven me to work with targeted groups. And it's the question I've over and over asked myself, what is it? You can all be there. And then looking at for young people, OK, well, can we teach them the skills to have the fun with the situation? Because just saying don't do it, it's not going to stop them. How can we teach them the skills, those risk assessing skills that mean that you know when your limits have been reached and your boundaries and you can leave or not do that bit. But you can still if you want to hang around with those people, you can still do it. You just keep yourself safe. Do you think that they learn skills or do you think it's, I think it's, it's natural nature? I think it's both, actually. I think in the same way as not, not sticking to the boundaries or staying safe is both. It's nature and nurture. Some people are naturally risk-averse and some are natural risk-takers. And one isn't better or worse than the other. It's just how you are. But you don't usually work that out until you're into your 20s or 30s. You know, some people will always still now. I mean, me, somebody phones me up and says, do you want a job in Guernsey for four months? I've agreed within 20 seconds. I'll work out the practicalities later. It just sounds like a good crack. Other people wouldn't do that because they'd be like, I mm, think I need to think it over. And what, what will I be giving up to get that? I'll just make it work when I get there. So it isn't a better trait, but I, as I'm older, I know when it's too big a risk for me. So I think you can get people to think about things, work out where their limits are, and the things that when they had done, done maybe gone further than they wanted to, what didn't they like about it? And can you kind of recall those feelings so that they become alarms? So there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely can. And from there, I thought, okay, now I've got to have a life. I've got this child. I want things in life. I want a good life for her. What, what do I need to do? And the only job I could think of was being a teacher because it works for the holidays. So I knew. I had to go and get some go and get some A levels because I've got no qualifications apart from, a, you know, a, an art college certificate. Well, I mean, I'm doing myself down. It was a three year course, so it was a proper course. What am I going to do? So I went and did an A level in English, and I did it in about five minutes, and was just so proud. I can't tell. It's the only certificate I've ever gone to collect. And it's the only one I can honestly say I felt truly, truly made up over. I just was so proud of myself. And I got an A. It was just so, you know, and I thought, oh, that's really easy. What was I thinking of? 
And that gave me the confidence to think, okay, I could be an art teacher. So I I worked, but by then I, I was an art teacher, but I worked in colleges. I did postgrad, taught reception for about five minutes and thought, I'm not doing that. But I got to the college, did evening classes, was really involved with returners to learning, particularly women who'd had children and maybe had never, you know, achieved in the workplace or had the education that they wanted or that they could do. And I realised there was a lot of coaching to that, to build people up, to believe that they could go for it and succeed. And then at the college, doing me introduction to watercolours, et cetera, classes, the college said to me, you're great with the teenagers. We've got these ones who are out, all out of school. They have to come here to do a basic life skills course. Otherwise, they don't get their government 20 quid a week. Could you come and work with them? And it was a match made in heaven. I loved it. So I changed the curriculum, made sure it said, no, it's our fault. If they're not coming to these classes because they're boring, how do we make it so that they are engaged and they enjoy? And from there, saw this advert because it was all term time only time. By this time, I've got pregnant again. And I'm thinking, right, OK, I need a job. It's baby number four. What am I going to do? And this job came up. It was uh, a maternity cover for a level three youth worker in a to manage a youth center that was about half a mile away from where I lived. And I thought, well, how hard can that be? They just youth workers, what do they do? Open the door, play pool, let the kids in, have a little bit of a chat, make coffee, put the music on, make sure nobody kills somebody when they're there. And I was so wrong. <laughs> I'm glad you so said that. <laughs> it is that and it's more. I mean, yeah, it's really handy. I still know how when you've dented the ping pong ball, I had to put it in hot water so it pops out again. I still play pool pretty good. But I'd learned that at college, you know, through my own misspent youth, I could do most of the things. And I worked on the basis, because although I was seven months pregnant covering this maternity leave, that nobody would be rude enough to say, excuse me, are you pregnant or just a bit fat? And they didn't. So when I got the job, got settled, I said, well, by the way, I need a couple of weeks off because I'm going to have a baby. Bloody hell. So I had me two weeks off, locked up my youth club on the Friday. Two weeks later, I was back in the office. And the team, I was the only female on the team. They were brilliant. All our team meetings, everything was arranged around my breastfeeding. I was taking baby into work. Also, for my young mum's group you know, where I recruited all my young women from the clinic that I went to. So I was still young myself. And it was brilliant fun and just thought, this is it. And what I brought to them was the fact that by then I knew how to write a curriculum, how to write a session plan, how to teach somebody things that are quite complicated in ways that are meaningful to them, because I'd learned that through the teaching and the teacher training. So I had the, the bare bones of all of that, which I could then put onto the youth work. And what from there, you, what, what did you learn from then? Because it's interesting you talking about learning the scaffolding and, and that kind of stuff, which, yeah. you know, puts pieces to curriculum together and that kind of thing. But what did you learn from then? Because it doesn't sound like you come from a background of like youth clubs or whatever, and you obviously you got this job and you made it work with your own situation, which is pretty mental. Yeah. But what did you learn I from then? It. Well, I, by that, well, 18 months later, because she was only supposed to be off for a while. And she wasn't. She was off for 18 months. 18 months later, she wants to come back to work. Somebody else wants to poach me for their team. But, of course, I'm not qualified for the job I'm doing and that I've been doing and getting praised for and loaned out to other teams to do girls' work for them. Was this local authority, was it? Yeah. Ah, wow, OK. And they said, well, hang on a minute. When did you qualify as a teacher? It's got to be after, before 1986. I said, well, of course it's not. Of course it's not. I was at school. Of course it's not. <laughs> it's not art college. So it definitely weren't then. Oh, well, I'm afraid you can't have a level. You'd have to go back as an apprentice, you know. And we don't do apprentices in this local authority. So the Duke of Edinburgh's team is where I went to next. For the main quirk is that they put together a post that was actually on teacher's salary because we're based in a school rather than the youth workers, but it was a youth work job. And it was part of the youth service. 
So I went there, and while I was there, I did a master's degree. Somebody let me do that by cobbling together my experience and all the other bits of qualifications I'd accrued by then. And I did a master's degree with a JNC attachment at Montford University, which is why I do anything for Leicester. And I, you know, I've done loads of like, whatever they ask me, if they ever ask me a favour, I'll do it for Leicester because they gave me that opportunity when nobody else would. You know what and shines what out? It shines out like a flipping beacon out of the screen is your first for learning. Because everything you said, you've had to jump in, learn, get on, to get to a situation where that was working out and then you're off doing someone else and learning someone else and i and i you well, know i had probably... to jump past and and I, it didn't make me popular at work and um it made me unpopular with some of the women at work who felt i was accused of career climbing i was actually accused of having well, inappropriate no. relationships no i was a single parent with four children only one wage coming in Nobody else is going to put the tea on the table. I just had to put my head down and work as hard as I could. And I was incredibly lucky that my mum and dad supported me in collecting the kids from school till I got back. But my teams, up until they went to secondary school, were all based around school hours and what my kids were doing and when their father would have them. I mean, obviously, they didn't, people didn't particularly know, but I always worked late on a Tuesday. We will now. Yeah. I always used to work late on a Tuesday. We always had a lot open dropping. Well, that's because that's when they dad had them for tea. Let's, let's fast track a little bit then, because, it, I mean, it's mad now how people get into certain things. Yeah, um, I had to work. I had to work harder, longer hours, and be better than anyone else. But that's obviously stood you in good stead. So I just want to kind of fast track a little bit. To, you know, that's obviously your gateway into, into youth work. But then, I way into anything. How, but 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 now, what do you what do you do now? And what's that connection with youth community work? What you know? What what is your role now? What is your existence now? I love bringing on new staff. So anything that's around staff development training, that's why I love it. I love seeing people switched on to something. A job that I love. I love youth work. I passionately believe in it. I don't, and it's not about it changes people's lives. I've never changed anybody's life except my own. But it's about giving people the belief you can change it. It's giving them the skills and the tools to make other choices and then being there, cheering them on and supporting them so that they believe they can achieve if they want to. And success looks different to other people, you know, to everybody. Even now, I still, I work extremely long hours, but I like it. I like being, I like work. If I'm bored and I've got nothing else to do, I'll work because I get I like it. It gives back to me too. I enjoy doing what I do. Uh, and I guess I'm still that person who walked into that youth club and couldn't believe I was going to get paid to do it because I liked it so much. So <laughs> yeah. And I'm not I'm not um precious about my work. I'm happy to share it with people. I am happy to give my time. If I believe in it, but I also know myself well enough to know I'm the world's worst if I've agreed to do something and I didn't want to do it really. And now I've learned. So if somebody asked me to do something and my initial response is, oh, God, I would no longer say, oh, right, I'll do it. Because I, I'm avoidant, so I'll spend far longer trying to get out of it. And if I just got on and did it. Yeah, I was also undiagnosed ADHD, so all sorts of stuff going on with that. My brain's on fire most of the time. Yeah, I can see. <laughs> not, not that I'm a doctor. And that's, that's quite hard, actually. It's tiring, isn't it? It's quite exhausting. So I understand that in others as well. That it's quite exhausting when your brain doesn't switch off easily. But it means you can create things all the time. You're constantly yeah. doing different things. You've got the ability to kind of soak things up and reimagine those things. And, and, and you've got the energy. And uh, I know it comes in peaks and troughs. Yeah. But you've got the energy to kind of push things through and, and you know, and, and, and get to get to the end of, of, of things where other people might be like, oh, my God. this. Is but that's about self-control, isn't it? So I know how my books go, right? In the same way as my painting used to. I get an idea and I want to do it. 
And it's all I can think about, all I can think about. While I'm doing the research, I'm boring people rigid with everything I've found out. It's all piled up around me in the same way as my paintings used to be. I get halfway through it and then my brain's on to the next thing. So I don't really want to finish it. So I am perfect working in a team with somebody, you know, that old Belbin stuff. Complete a finisher is great with me because they do the bits that they like and I'm I'm all all looking for pioneering. the pioneering. You're a pioneer. I'm a pioneer. <laughs> but I also <laughs> I also make myself finish it because it's it is good for me. So I can do it. And I'm good at evaluation because I'm good at detail. Very good at I, I can notice the detail in anything. But you know, I know I know how I work. So I make sure I put in all the effort at the beginning when I'm still interested. And when I come to actually write that book, it's more or less in my head. I just sit down. I know exactly what I'm going to do. And I just sit down for three days solid, four days solid and write it. But won't be tired anybody who interrupts me in that time. I'm deeply unpleasant. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask you another question now. So I was going to, um, I was going to say to you, so it's, I mean, you can obviously see that you've been working within youth and community work for 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 quite a long time um yeah 25 years with the mya this week unbelievable since they since the first piece of work i did from 25 years where's that time gone then have they sent you a badge no <laughs> but it was came up on linkedin i can't believe it 25 years, well, 25 what's the years. What, what i'm interested in is the fact that like, what's the difference is in youth work now Compared to 25 years ago. What's your thoughts on that? I'm in charge now. <laughs> no. Other than that. <laughs> Other than that. Uh, what's different? The, the boom time for me for when we were really doing good work and there was money was pre-2010. From about, from about 1998. So when I started, I suppose, 1998, right till, through, till about 2010, there was money. There was an acknowledgement that young people don't just, I mean, this idea of a golden age, I was never part of that. You know, when people say, oh, back in the day, we didn't need consent forms. You just used to bung them out in the back of a minibus. You know, I was told by detached workers, oh, we will never be able to engage with them now that we're not allowed to claim cigarettes on our expenses. And I'm thinking, what? Claim what? You can't be smoking with young people. I don't remember that time has never been my time. My time has always been risk assessments doing things the same way as we do them now. Um, but there was money and there seemed to be an acknowledgement by government of the worth of youth work and understanding how we fit within a wider raft of community support. So becoming part of that community of support, but we're there for the young people. And, you know, that might involve supporting parents by talking to them or whatever. It wasn't rather than we own, we're the youth workers, we only work with young people. I was I was part of, I'm not part of that generation of youth workers. My I came through I guess with hotspots, working in targeted areas. That's that's the agenda I came in on, and teenage pregnancy, all that stuff was all the areas I worked in. And I've only ever done targeted youth work, so I equally have never done. Oh, you know, it, there's no youth club in the area. Let's have open it up and it, anybody can come. I've worked in the universal services. And I do again now, which is what's so exciting about what we're doing now in Sheffield, because we've got universal services and that's just amazing. So all young people coming in rather than, you know, only those that are coming through as referrals, which I did for quite a long time. And I like it, but it's great to have that having centres in areas and young people can come in and get involved. So that really early prevention, which I believe is the way we should be doing. We are for me, youth work is safeguarding. And it is early intervention and prevention work. It is by its very nature. It's what we do. So, I mean, it sounds, obviously, you've just explained your, your journey up to this point, but what you've just heard about Sheffield, I mean, that isn't the norm, is it? No. Like, that is not the norm. We are really the lucky. Mm. Can yeah. you explain and a bit more was, about that? Well, it's why, I mean, why I, uh, you know, again, not great. Yeah, I, I accepted the post. Because it's what I wanted to do. I think it's great. We've got we've got a relatively young head of service who's come up through youth work herself, and she is creative. And <laughs> we did we did this team day away where we had to. It was great. It was an exercise that 
I don't, it wasn't me doing it. That is often done by young people to work out which sort of which is your spirit animal. And it was no surprise to anybody else in the team that me and her came out as the same. But uh, what was your animal? Fal- uh, falcon. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all about going over the top. Big idea. Was there, was there any mice in the room? Because I bet they were breaking it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and she's done out. She's creative. She's got loads of ideas. And part of that is she's got the universal service. She's got the preventative service. We've got IAG. And we've also got Youth Voice and Influence all under one. And I sit across all the top of all of them, which I really enjoy, you know, supporting and developing pieces of work. Only a year because it's a new service. It's a developmental role. And it's, it's, a, it's a real privilege to be able to work with people as we're developing a new, a new service for the city because the city is great. It's a, it's a really interesting set of communities. It, it, it's got an amazing history of youth work in Sheffield. You know, Sue Atkins and people like that is where they come from. So the people I quoted back in the day in my dissertations came from there. But like many places, youth services were, were decimated for a while. So it's interesting to see what's coming out of it. Plus, there's a massive community voluntary sector who are doing amazing things as well. So together, you know, if we can create some form of partnership with them, Sheffield's going to be a, a brilliant place to want to work as a youth worker, whether you're sta- in the in the local authority or you're in the voluntary sector. It's creative, it's exciting. I mean, Sheffield sounds like the Mecca. But, I mean, can you paint a picture of your understanding of, you know, the, the rest of the country? Because that, that doesn't sound... No, like... but there's interesting things happening in all sorts of places. You know, there are shoots of of... of innovation and creation and maybe not having the money has forced everybody to be a bit more creative and and innovative about what they're doing that doesn't mean to say that we don't all need it of course all all areas need investment in their young people but yeah some area you know sitting next to talking to the guy who's the head of service in Leeds he's doing interesting stuff too there's stuff happening what there isn't is maybe back in the day there were more conferences, there were more opportunities to share that practice, to learn from each other. And I often feel that's my privilege because I work from the t- literally from the top of Scotland down to, to you know, across to Northern Ireland, down to, into Wales. I work across all areas. And so often I can, I'm good at bringing people together who perhaps are doing something really interesting here and there's other people who've got a similar issue somewhere else and bringing people together because we can learn from each other. And that, I think, youth work is, you know, that reflective practice that's at the heart of all youth work. I think it's one of our strengths. We do like to learn from each other. We don't assume that our way is the only way. So, yeah, there is interesting stuff going on, well, including yourself and what you're doing. Because let's not forget, I was interested enough in yours to want to come work with you as well. Yeah, no, I, I do agree that, you know, there's... there's... There's lots of things that, that happen when times are difficult. You have to look for another way. And then sometimes that means that fresh shoots come up that wouldn't normally have come up. So, you know, there's there's lots of benefits to having diverse offers of different things that suit different young people or just different people in general. I, I, I However, agree. if you're asking me if I think it's fair that there's a postcode lottery for young people as to whether they get service. No, I don't. You know, young people, it's a right. It shouldn't be some sort of privilege of where you live that you get the opportunity to engage in youth provision, whatever that looks like, whether it's a youth club or detached, but it doesn't matter. You know, some young people still have got absolutely nothing in their area. And that's not because youth workers don't want to do it. It's because there's no money and no infrastructure there. I mean, I just, I, I wonder, you know, obviously it's, we're red hot on it, aren't we? It's, it's Poland Day. So, um, you know. Oh, yeah. There could be a change of foot. There, there may not. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? I won't call you on that. On that well, I would have liked, what I will say is I would have liked to have seen more from every part of the major parties around their plans for supporting young people, because I think they've got a really raw deal, you know, living through a pandemic, which adults, oh, we've all forgotten about that. But young people haven't. It, it was a really core point in their development, you know, that they were kept inside and had education messed around with and all the rest of it. You know, I'd like to have seen more idea of what we're going to do about that. Things like county lines, exploitation, all the stuff that I've worked in predominantly 
over the last 10 years. Where's the money? You know, I'd like to hear more about what we're going to do about that to support young people rather than seeing them as a problem, how we're going to actually enable them to achieve whatever that looks like. I just, I, I it's interesting. I was out with a group yesterday and, um, you know, they're, they're older, young adults really from, from 17 up to probably about 25 chatting to them about various different things. It is, it's basically part of this aftercare support that we were doing after the GAP programmes where called Best Foot Forwards, we basically go for walks and people can talk about the things that matter to them. And one of the things that come up was the whole thing around politics. And I just, I mean, I, I connect it with this just simply because obviously, you know, we're all going to be voting today. But when I say to them, are you voting? The answer is no. Why would I vote? Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't vote until I was 30. And, you you know, you could be like, well, why aren't you doing that? Well, you don't know if you don't know, do you? And it's just it's a simple thing with them. But I think to myself, you know, where are those young people going to learn about politics if they don't learn at home, if they don't learn at school? The only place that I ever knew of people learning is in the youth clubs. And I, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying it's the only place in space, but I absolutely... But those young people, uh, you know, probably from you know more challenging backgrounds, maybe, or not necessarily challenging, but, you know, where there's less money around, for example. Sure. And then they won't necessarily, they, they may get tuned into to politics and, you know, the basics of the different parties. And then they make their own choices. But the trouble is, if you don't know that, and you've got no, no idea, what yeah. is the potential impact of your vote on yourself, on your family, on your community? On the country, why would you bother? And I and I hear that now, and I just think, you know, maybe it's thinking... handy, isn't it? And if poli- well, I guess you could argue the cynic would say, well, if if pol- if we can, if politicians can sell that to young people, that there's no point in voting really because you can't really bring about any change. That's great, isn't it? You know, well... you cut down to those people who really do want to vote, and the, you know that who know which way they're going to vote. I don't know. But what I do know is that in, in years ago, a long time ago, I wrote something along. I wasn't the sole writer. I'm not going to claim it. I, I, I know there was Carla and there was another person who worked with us for the Electoral Commission called the Democracy Cookbook a long time ago. And funnily enough, I'd almost forgotten that job, except that somebody I'm working with in Sheffield has got a copy and said, oh, I don't know if you know about this. And I was like, uh, yeah, have a look in the phone. It's got my name. And we were doing, because what we were looking at was the campaign that UK youth have been doing and make your mark and give an X, saying, OK, well, how are we going to make that local? And so we've been doing, using activities from that and others that have been put out more recently. So it's not about telling them, telling her people who to vote for. It's about democracy and understanding what it is, what your vote does, how you vote, blah, blah, blah. And we've been doing that not just with our Youth Voice and Influence team, uh, doing it with their young people like the Youth Cabinet. They've been doing it in the youth clubs as well. So working with young people who are too young to vote at the moment, but to talk about what the point is, how you do it, why you should do it or not, you know, you don't have to, or what happens if you spoil your vote? What happens? Does anybody actually see your protest? You know, all those things that we can answer without becoming political or in, within terms of persuading people who to vote for. Because that isn't that isn't the point of it. The point is we can all have a vote once we're over 18. Well, we all should have our voice heard and we should all feel like we're yeah. valued enough. And I, I think the thing is as well, you know, someone understanding the, the basic differences of different parties and that just being laid out to them, no different than different faiths and religions being laid out to them and people getting to choose based on whatever, you know, whatever they Absolutely. want to choose on, is 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 surely the, the way to go. And then, I mean, all the stuff you already know, coming up with different policies and ideas of things that they would want to bring to the country. And why, why shouldn't we be doing that? Of course we should. The cynic in me would say that the people that don't want you to do that are the people that have more voters that are 50, 60 plus. Why would they want a load of young'uns coming up thinking, hang on a minute, we can change the world for a better place for everyone and anyone? Anyway, don't get me started. It's another, that's why we need more youth work conferences so we can have these kind of conversations. And somebody can say, I'm doing a really good piece of work that worked really well on that. Would you like to have a look at it? 
oh yes please and then we all go you know that's what we need more of but they are so expensive and you'll notice anything i do i try and keep the price right down because i think it is wrong to be asking 275 quid for a, for a conference ticket i understand why you have to ask for it because everything costs money but it's why you know myself and charlotte gordon we've been doing things where we get together using the people that we know who are experts in the field bringing them together to do an online conference where we can charge a five or a ticket because then everybody truly can right? come it's an inclusive space it's the people that probably wouldn't be able to afford to do those things they're doing the work on the ground that if you make it accessible then the the, the ripples of that are probably going to end up rippling across young people that are probably i don't know more disadvantaged as well you know the, yeah, light yeah, sure. the, the, the waves of that influence will not necessarily be stronger everyone deserves yeah. to you know to improve and learn learn best practice and all the rest of it let me let me jump straight into something else in a minute because yeah, i need to because i've got to go and do that no problem <laughs> no problem I'm interested to hear there's only a, there's a couple more questions but i'm interested to hear so the difference is you're talking about youth work over the last 25 years but what are the main differences bullet point them if you want because of time with young people now compared to young people 25 years ago what are the differences the challenges the positives okay in terms of the issues i i think at the root of all adolescence is who am i where do i belong what do i believe in who do i want to be will anybody ever fancy me am i normal all those kind of things have stayed exactly the same. It's too simplistic. Oh, social media. Because people love to blame it on that. And yet I love social media. Am I glad that social media wasn't around when I was a teenager? Yes. Why? Because it's not all documented and out there. And I think it would. I would have found it really hard. I feel I would have felt I had to live up to my image out on the streets on social media. Whereas I could probably go home and shut the door and just be writing me poetry somewhere if I wanted to but I had to call them song lyrics when I was out with my friends <laughs> so you know just stuff like that um I think there is more challenges because the word is more more connected I fear that they if we look at the cultural wallpaper I love that description of young people now I think it's challenging that there's it's all out there you know we say don't do things yet we see so a classic example is we say that gangs are wrong we say you shouldn't be a gangster and that actually making money through drug dealing is really wrong and it is all those things but there's not a lot on netflix is there that isn't the essex boys vengeance is mine get out there be a gangster make a load of money or a documentary on the quote craze or those essex boys or esco you know whatever it's all there so we say one thing but the cultural wallpaper is different. We've got somebody like Andrew Tate said, a man who's got no physicality will never have success. You know, if you're a real man, you've got to be able to fight. You go and take what's yours. Then we tell people we can't be selfish because we've got to be kind. We shouldn't be taking what isn't ours. You know, and you've got so to be beautiful. And on top of that, you've got to look good at all times. And we've got very narrow aesthetics on social media and on, on, on the media in general of what we should look like. But we tell people they should be themselves. Would it be fair to say then that the role models maybe haven't changed so much? You were talking about the craze and various other things. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I know like the, the role models maybe, but the fact that it's in your face 24 hours a day is, yeah, yeah, is for sure. like water so, torture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it is. And we absorb, we all know, if you want to teach children, I think children learn from what they see, not what you tell them, really. So I would say, you know, we're, we're always talking about this kind of, stuff around gender equality, misogyny, da, da, da. so go and have a look in your youth club. Who's doing, we talk about it, equality, we talk about diversity, we talk about inclusion. We're looking at the gender aspect in, in terms of sexism or misogyny. Go and have a look, just see what people are doing. You know, have you got all the men doing all the activities and kicking, doing the kick around outside and playing pool and doing all the the action, taking them on the climbing ropes when you go on the residential. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, the women are cooking the dinners. I don't know. And doing the caring roles. 
you know. Yeah. Well, do people fall into what they feel safe and comfortable in, or is it because they don't want to challenge themselves, or is it because that people are leading on these things are just kind of that's how they they direct people to do that stuff? Can they automatically think stereotypes? That's it. That's your job. Who knows? Who knows? And does it even matter? I guess. But I'm, I'm not sure the stereotypes have changed that much. I guess is what I'm saying. So I wonder then. How do you think youth work could be best placed placed in society today to better support young people? I think it needs to be community based. Can you explain I think it's about that? I think it's about locality uh, being community based in the communities where we work. I think it's about understanding the locality, understanding the rhythm and the challenges and the and the you know being part of that fabric of that community and being a trusted resource, a trusted adult, rather than being in one central office and, you know, people go down there. That being community-based, maybe in teams with others that work in that area, working in partnership, money's not going to come flooding back in. So we've got to look at creative partnerships of who we work with. Yeah. I can't remember the question because I'm now thinking about what I've got to do next. Sorry. Uh, Tell me. Yeah, I mean, you think you've you've answered it quite well. But it's 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 about the, you know, what what would youth work or what should youth work look like now, in the modern day? Yeah, yeah, um, it's, got, it's got to be community. Uh, definitely, we need to work smarter. We also need to explore and be more confident in our digital youth work. You know, it's funny though because I don't know. I've, just, I've spoken, so I'm starting to speak to a few different professionals, and so I'm chatting to you. I'm chatting to other people in Bristol and. And, and, you know, everyone's getting the same kind of questions and, and, and similar kind of answers are coming out with this question. And it does feel like there's a little bit of like, you know, bringing it back a little bit. So things were place based and, you know, you have people with lived experience coming from those communities that had volunteered, that had been supported, that had done courses that then ended up, you know, supporting people from those communities that walked in the same shoes. It feels like it's a similar thing that has gone and days gone by, although there isn't the infrastructure maybe in this and the same amount of money to make this kind of stuff happen. I mean, there doesn't need to be any more than that. I'm not saying there is, but is there any more than that? Well, I, I mean, youth work is all about building relationships, isn't it? And to build relationships, you've got to be there long enough. So parachuting people in for three months at a time, do your detach, it's going to change the world, move on. It won't because you're not there long enough so and you haven't built any trust. Change. Do you think that will change? So that said, and I think every youth worker on the planet will agree with you, but most people listening to this will think, well, that makes sense. To feel comfortable and feel like you belong and, and you've connected with someone, you know, for that to then build over X amount of years and then you need to know siblings and family members and everything else. Obviously, that's going to give you a stronger kind of place to, to work with people and to support them on their journeys into whatever they want to go into. But then that surely then links back into the thing we were chatting to before about the government, and I guess... I don't know. Somebody asked me a really, said to me a really interesting... Well, it made me smirk at first. But they said to me, I keep saying to people, what kind of adults do you want looking after you in care homes? Because that's what we're creating now. They will be those adults. And I thought it was a really interesting question. Who do, who do you want caring for you in your old age? Because they are the teenagers of today. Well, that, that's... And I know it's a bit trite, but it does make you think just a little bit, doesn't it? And what world do you want to be living in then? Because if we bring everybody up to be, you know, selfish, if you like, thinking nobody else but themselves, put their own needs first, don't, you know, community, no such thing as community. Hmm, I think there was a politician called a female prime minister who said something very similar. No such thing as society. I mean, what you're saying there, that. though, what what you're saying there is is something that the difference with that is that that means that everyone needs to reflect, no matter what their situation is, no matter you know what their their work situation, their financial situation. Everyone has to reflect on what everyone's doing. And I think maybe that 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 question goes out to a, a wider set of people that aren't involved in youth work. Which I think probably does. Everyone think about it, and that, and that that probably is where we need to go to be able to to provide a, a better provision for any young person growing up. However, there are good people who care 
and but they shouldn't be exploited. And there's that to be thinking of as well. We can't keep expecting people, you know, this idea that volunteers will do it. People are having to work. You know, everybody's having a hard time out there. There isn't the capacity to work, volunteer, give your all. It, it, it's, uh, so we need to temper that with, yes, of course, within communities, it's great to have people who live there who want to help. But we shouldn't exploit that. Yes, I think we should be growing our own workforces because we've also lost a generation of youth workers. Yeah. Don't, since 2010. Oh, no. Based yeah. on our previous conversations. And it's national, you know, so we need to be growing our own workforce. Those people who are interested, who want to make a difference, those young people who, you know, so the, the campaign at the moment, which Leeds Tune is really running with around hashtag choose, choose youth, or choose youth work, which is all around seeing youth work as a viable career. Because there are jobs out there. There are jobs out there. We can't fill them with qualified staff. So, you know, an apprenticeship, there's different ways of doing it. And I think we need to be really supporting that and trying to get, get more people into the sector with the skills that are needed for now, with all those different lived experiences and not putting up barriers to get... Main thing that stopped me being a youth worker sooner was a barrier put up in front of me. Nobody said you need to, well, you know, if you want to do that full time, you need to qualify. And this is the route. This is how you could do it. I had to go out and find that for myself and then push and push and push until I could find somewhere. But not everybody's got, is able to do that. You know, in the meantime, the bit I didn't tell you, I was still working bars. Got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Let's just finish on one last last quick question then. Look, thank you for taking the time for chatting. I know you're well, very busy and I know you've got things you need to be sorting out like, right now. Yes. So just the, the final question we ask everyone, and this can this answer can be anything you want it to be, whether it's connected with youth work, community work, connected with any other thoughts or values that you may may have. But what is it that really matters to you? At your essence, what really matters to you? I don't know. It's too big a question, isn't it? <laughs> you're you're already halfway out the door. I got to sort some stuff out. Come on, you can do this. You can do this. What really matters to you? If I said to you now, don't just think about work. What really matters to you, and why? I, I really don't know. I don't know what you. I don't know what what sort of thing. Loads of things matter to me. I don't know what you mean. My kids are my world. I mean, they're the things that matter to me. And I don't want that. I don't want the party to stop ever. That's also what's important to me. You know. That's a good enough, that's a good enough answer. That's the thing. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no right or wrong answer. What you, what, you know, some people might say they want to solve world famine. Some people might say that, you know, their family, you know, and, and, and there's nothing right or nothing and what's wrong. what's important to me? Oh, yeah, I don't know. I love the youth work party, but I mean that collectively of, of all the parties, all the things that I love. I never really want them to stop going and to stop stop doing it. I can't imagine a time when I won't do youth work. I don't know what I'd do with myself. I have a funny feeling you might be doing it for the rest of your days based on... I think I might be too. Have. I mean, Sue Atkins was 80-something, and I saw her in a meeting that I was in, uh, in Sheffield. We were there. For, it was about young people, something they'd done... Um, them doing a consultation, young people's consultation. And I saw her there, engaged, motivated, asking questions the Thursday before she passed at the weekend. Maybe that'll be me too. I don't know. I've created my children to be party people too, to go off and do, they all work in similar-ish fields. Well, I think it's a much better place with you still banging a drum and, you know, with the experiences and the things you talk about. So I hope you do. It's all well, I know. Got a few years yet. Anyway, I can get a load more involved and drag them all along as well. <laughs> <laughs> Look, thanks for chatting again. I know you've got stuff to go on to. So yeah, I'm uh... really sorry. I'm really sorry. And the last answer was pretty rubbish, so I'd cut it if I was you. Because it's meaningless, but I and I'm sorry I couldn't do it. But I've got somebody on the other side saying, "No problem." I'm going to stop recording and then I'm going to say goodbye. All right, sweetheart.